December brings with it all sorts of ideas, all sorts of traditions, uh, and different people do different things, and it's normally a whole lot of fun, and people do, do different things for fun. But one thing that seems quite universal about Christmas time seems like everybody does at least one thing quite similar, and that is the giving of gifts. Now, I don't know how many of you here love to receive gifts. Just by a show of hands, three, four of you. Okay, great. A few more. Gifts... Gifts are a big thing at Christmas time, and it seems like different people, different families do things differently. So for some people, Christmas Eve is the time when the exchanging of gifts happen, and it's all very exciting. And for other people, uh, they make a moment of it on Christmas morning, uh, first thing in the morning. And as a dad, I can't tell you uh, the joy that it is to see that look on your kid's face as they wake up on Christmas morning and know that uh, it is Christmas morning and run under to find what's waiting for them. And so all sorts of uh, different ways of doing gifts uh, happen over Christmas time. And gifts are an interesting thing. I don't know how many of you have read a book called, uh, what is it called? The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. Uh, so basically what the author is suggesting is that we as humans have five primary ways of feeling love, of feeling uh, expression of love towards us. Um, I'm going to go through the five uh, main love languages and just put up your hand if you feel that this is your love language. This is how you feel loved. The first one is words of affirmation. Anybody? Your love language, words of affirmation. Yes. All right. The second one, acts of service. Acts of service. Okay. Okay. Slightly less, slightly less. Uh, the next one is quality time. Who feels loved by quality time? Yes, a lot of us, definitely. Uh, quality time. The next one is physical touch. Okay, okay, we don't need to know. All right, I didn't say put up your hand for that one. Okay. And then there's one more, and let's just see again if this is actually your love language. There's the last one, which is actually the receiving of gifts. All right. So those are the, the five main love languages that this author is, is, is saying that we have. And for me, I would say my number one is words of affirmation. And then I'd say number two, maybe even a slightly higher than that, would be the receiving of gifts. And so basically, if after the gathering today, you came up to me and you told me what an amazing, incredible sermon this was, and then you just left me a little gift on the side, I would feel like the most loved person here today. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that there. Just, uh, as a, uh, that's just a little intro that I'm leaving for you guys. Although the problem with me is that I'm quite fussy. You may not know this, but I'm actually quite a particular person. And so when it comes to the giving of gifts, um, I am quite particular about what that gift is. And unfortunately, I've got one of those faces that gives me away all the time. I can't hide anything on this face. And so it can get a little bit awkward when a gift comes, and I'm excited about it because that is how I receive and feel loved. But my face gives me away when I open it, and it's not something that I want or that I was expecting. It gets to be a bit of a problem, especially when it's a gift that I've been expecting for a while. So, for example, you know, you're expecting a gift on your birthday. You're expecting one, for example, on, on Father's Day for me. And it comes around, and my wife is amazing. Don't get me started on my wife. She's a machine. She's the business. And those of you who know, know that she is the backbone of this church and the backbone of our family, and she's the, the real deal, and we love her. So she gets me a gift for Father's Day every year on behalf of the kids, which is cool. Uh, and uh, no, it was this year, this year Father's Day coming around. I'm expecting the gift. I'm waiting for it. I know a gift is coming. It's exciting. It comes. It's a Sunday. We know what Sundays are like. Church, church, church. The afternoon comes. I'm ready. I'm expecting. I'm waiting for this gift. She tells me that there's a gift. I get home. I ask, where's the gift? Somehow, the gift has been lost. Now, we don't live in a huge house, but somehow, in and amongst the few rooms in our house, this gift has been lost that she has bought. Now, that's quite disappointing to me, but at the same time, also quite exciting because I know that the gift will still come at some point. So, that excitement continues. Well, it was weeks later. Weeks later, I might have even forgotten about it. She comes very excitingly to tell me, I have found the gift, your four Father's Day. And she brings it through. She hasn't even wrapped it which is part of the whole experience for those of us who love to receive gifts. She didn't even put it in a gift bag, which is like, you know, people who are too lazy to wrap a gift just put it in a gift bag. Not even a gift bag. 
just gives it to me. And unfortunately, in the moment, I look at this gift and I'm like, what is this? And it was a, it was a swimming towel. And I was like, I already have a swimming towel, maybe even more than one. And so my face gave me away. It wasn't what I was expecting. And actually, it just felt like a bit, after all that, a bit of a letdown. And she's very gracious, my wife, because she knows that it's all right. Because I'm going to say to her, just let me know where you got it. Because I have no problem taking it back and exchanging it for what I actually do want. And that's fine. And she lets me do that. And then I get to do that. So that was, that was a, a, an example of um, expecting a gift waiting for it in anticipation, and then when it actually comes, it's not exactly what it, you expect, and uh, you're a little bit disappointed, a little bit let down. And the Christmas story is a lot, um, it, it, it's similar, it's not what many people expected. This gift that came was not what people were expecting, uh, but it certainly isn't a let down. And today I'm kicking off our Christmas series here at City. It's starting today, and we'll wrap up, excuse the pun, on Christmas Eve, um, and this series is simply called The Gift. The Gift. And a spoiler alert in case you don't know, I'm just going to let you in, that the gift that we're talking about, the gift at Christmas time, is Jesus himself, the Savior of the world, coming to us in human form. And let me tell you that this gift is the greatest of all time. We're going to be taking a look at this incredible gift that was sent us to heaven. And then we're going to take a look at how this Christmas story and our own human experiences connect. The title of today's message, part one, is The Gift No One Expected. The Gift No One Expected. And so what we're going to do is dive straight into Luke chapter 2, uh, where we're going to read Luke's account of the Christmas story. So it will be on the screen behind me as we go. It says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And so the first point that I want to take out of this, um, in this, this Luke's um, account of what the Christmas story was and my first point today is the wait. The wait. In the lead up to the story and to the birth of Jesus, we find ourselves in Israel. Now, Israel was a nation in waiting. And I don't just mean waiting, I mean waiting. Because for 400 years leading up to the birth of Jesus, God was actually silent. God was completely silent. He spoke no prophetic words. He gave no psalms. He spoke no words of encouragement to his people. And for centuries, dating all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, there had been these words. There were scriptures that were pointing to a Savior who would deliver the world from the bondage of sin. A Savior was coming to save this world from sin and to establish God's kingdom on earth. But for 400 years leading up to this, there was just silence from God. And it was a long 400 years of waiting and waiting and waiting. And the thing is that through these 400 years, we find that there were not even any markers along the way to let Israel know, to let the world know how far the Savior was. When was the Savior coming? Nobody knew. There were no markers. Now, I know a lot of you a couple of weeks ago rode the 947. Well done for that. Uh, I remember when I rode it, one of the things that helped me the most, that I loved the most about it, were the markers. So you knew that while you were riding, you'd see a marker that said 84 kilometers. 
So you knew that you had done 10, so it was a little bit um, exhausting to think that you had 84 kilometers to go, but it was good to know that you had 10 behind you. You knew where you were at towards the end. And then the best part for me was when it started counting down every single kilometer. So it went from 10 to 9 to 8, and then you know you get into the end, and you're almost there, and you can push through. But for Israel, there was none of that. There were no markers. There were no words. There was no idea of how close the Savior of the world was. The promise was there. It was huge. It was significant. God himself was going to arrive to be the Savior of the world. But when? Nobody knew. And how? Nobody could have expected. And the waiting continued in Israel. At the same time as this was happening, Mary and Joseph were in their own waiting as well. Luke takes us to the hills of a small, out-of-the-way region called Galilee, and that's where we found this woman called Mary. She was engaged to be married to Joseph, and an angel of the Lord appears to Mary and tells her that she would have a child, and it was going to be a boy, and his name was going to be Jesus. In Hebrew, that means the Lord saves. But Mary has doubt when this happens, and she questions, how could this be? How could this happen? And Because she's like, well... First of all, I'm a virgin. Second of all, well, there is no second of all, because how could this be possible? She has doubt in her heart. She questions it. And the angel of the Lord explains to her that the same Holy Spirit that brought light and brought life in Genesis chapter 1 would also supernaturally generate life inside her womb. And what God is doing right now is he is binding himself to humanity through this miraculous conception and birth. The promise of Jesus had been given to Mary and to Joseph, but they had to wait for that moment to happen. It had to be the moment that God had designed for it to happen. It had to be the setting that God would design for it to happen. And it truly wasn't what anyone was expecting as the king to come into the world. And I feel like it's in these times for us, even today, um, these times of waiting, that we can often become so tripped up in our own lives. We find ourselves in times of waiting, and when that happens, at best, we can doubt what we've heard. We can question, is that true? Did I really hear God correctly? Like Mary, how can it possibly be true? How can this be happening? And at worst, we can find ourselves completely checking out and walking away from the very thing that God wants to give us, the very thing that God wants to do in us, and the very thing that God wants to do through us. But in this moment, Mary has this realization of what is happening and what God is doing. It's almost like as this was happening, the penny suddenly dropped for Mary The 400 years of silence was about to be broken through the first cry of this baby that was going to be birthed by her in a stable. And we see in Scripture that she sings a song about how this reversal, I mean, she was a nobody, and she was going to give birth to the one who was going to save the world. And so she sings this song about how the reversal of her own social status is going to bring a greater upheaval. Through her son, God is going to bring down leaders from their thrones, and he's going to exalt the poor and the humble, and he's going to turn the whole world order upside down. But can you imagine if Mary had said no? Imagine if she had walked away from this because it just felt too long, the weight felt too much. And maybe today you're sitting here and you're feeling like you have been in 400 years of silence, like Israel. You know that God has a will for your life. You know that God has a purpose for your life. But it just feels like you've been facing too many years of silence and you've been facing too many years of waiting. You wish there could at least be a marker for you along the way to show you how far God is in doing what he has promised to do in your life. But there just seems to be nothing. The truth is that what we find in the story, the story of this remarkable gift, is that it only arrives in God's timing. It only arrives in God's way, and so often it's not how we expect it. 
often our expectation of how God should work and when God should work are far from the reality of how God will actually work. And far too often we can shortcut, we can short circuit the plan of God over our lives because we are not willing to understand and we are not willing to accept God's timing in our lives. I believe that what God is saying to you today, if that is you, is that His timing is perfect. He wants you to hear this morning that in His waiting, in your waiting, His timing is perfect, that His ways are perfect. They are higher than your ways. And just like for the nation of Israel and just like for Mary and Joseph, that promise will be fulfilled. Amen? The promise that God has given to you, the purpose and the plan that He has for your life will be fulfilled. But you need to learn this morning. You need to learn how to rest in God's perfect timing. The second part of what we're going to look at today that we're going to pick out from Luke's account, and my second point, is the darkness. Perhaps what doesn't get a lot of airtime in Christmas preachers is that the context that Mary and Joseph found themselves in in this moment of their lives was actually a time of great darkness. It was a time of darkness for Israel as a nation, and it was also a time of personal darkness for Mary and Joseph. In Isaiah, we read um, that the light of the world was coming into the world, but it was coming to a people shrouded in darkness. In Isaiah 9, it says that, and it uses words like gloom and anguish and contempt as some of the adjectives to describe this darkness of the time. And so Mary and Joseph lived in this town called Nazareth, but they had to travel to the city of Bethlehem to register for a census that had been ordered by the Roman Empire, whose name was Caesar Augustus. Now, Nazareth and Bethlehem are both in the nation of Israel, but it's about a 105-kilometer journey uh, between the two. And obviously, in those days of no modern transport, it was a significant journey. It was a journey that would have taken several days to happen. And the sens census had been called. I've got whackhead in my head, the senseless survey. But it was a senseless census. And the only reason that it had been called at the time was to exert political power um, in, in the land. Because at this point, Israel was under huge political oppression. The people of God were under the oppressive rule of Rome. And it was just a blatant reminder for them that they were owned by someone else. Because in some ways, Israel had escaped exile. They didn't live in Babylon anymore. But in many ways, they were just exiles in their own country. Their own temple was built by a foreigner called Herod the Great. And there was just political darkness that was reigning uh, in, the, in, the, in the nation. Just a little side note uh, while we're here is that while this is happening, while this darkness is there, uh, they've been sent for no reason to go from where they are, upheave their lives to go register for a census in another town. It seems like darkness is conquering light. But actually behind the scenes, and this is what God does behind the scenes, he was working because he was fulfilling the prophecy of where the Savior of the world would be born. And he was physically moving Mary, who was carrying the Savior of the world, to where she needed to be for this prophecy to be fulfilled. And so behind the scenes, when it looks like darkness is conquering the light, it is not. God is continuing to work in that. But that's just a little side note. Back to Israel and the state of darkness and oppression. While that was happening, while this darkness was in Israel, Mary and Joseph were actually in their own personal darkness as well. They had discovered this momentous news, this amazing news that Mary had miraculously conceived a child by the Holy Spirit. The one that she bore was going to be the savior of the world that had been promised for so long. And this was incredible news. It was incredibly exciting news. But along with this amazing news came personal crisis. Earlier in Luke, we read that Mary was greatly troubled by this news. And we even see Joseph initially wanting to leave Mary quietly. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, it says that Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, had resolved to leave her quietly. And now in the midst of all of this, their lives were being further disrupted by having to make this unnecessary, seemingly unnecessary journey to Bethlehem, where there wouldn't even be a room for them to stay when they arrived. 
They were going to have to have a treacherous journey. They were going to have to face hills and streams. Mary was going to be heavily pregnant at this time. It was going to be a very dark walk for Mary and for Joseph. And so we find Joseph doubting. We find Mary doubting. And we find this time of great uncertainty and doubt in their lives. I wonder how often the context that we see here is so similar to our own setting in our lives. I wonder how much of our lives just feel like a state of darkness. How much of our lives feel like a state of crisis. And maybe it feels like you're in a personal crisis this morning that feels like it's quite overwhelming to you. Maybe you feel like you're living in a state of darkness that's all around you. Maybe sometimes you look around in our own country and you feel like the political climate of South Africa, similar to Israel, is one of oppression and you just don't know which way to turn. And I just want to tell you this morning that darkness in our lives, darkness in your life, is a dangerous thing. I don't know how many of you as children, or if you have your own children, have have had that experience of children who are scared of the dark and are convinced that they see things in the dark. And I guess night lights are a big thing, a big seller because it just seems to be a thing. When you're small and you're a child, and I think I've known a couple of people who have grown up as adults and still have their night light on in their room, there's something about the dark. There's something scary. You think you see things that aren't there, and it's a real thing. But darkness in our lives is a dangerous thing. Darkness causes us to see things that are not really there, and it causes us to believe things that are not really true. I'm going to say that again. Darkness causes us to see things that are not really there, and it causes us to believe things that are not really true. And of course, light is the exact opposite of that. Light brings clarity. Light reveals reality. Light enables us to see things the way that they really are. Light causes us to see things that are really there and causes us to believe things that are really true. Light brings with it comfort and joy and hope. And we can take it a step further. We can say that this light brings God's clarity. This light reveals God's reality. This light enables us to see the things the way God sees them. This light brings with it God's comfort. It brings with it God's joy. And it brings with it God's hope. Amen. I love that when the Bible talks about this birth of Jesus, this arrival of the Savior of the world into our lives, it describes this event as light coming into the darkness. In John chapter 1 verse 4, it says, In him was life, and the life was light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. So what John is telling us here is that Jesus came to the world as the light of the world to dispel the darkness in the world. I'll say that again. Jesus came to the world as the light of the world to dispel the darkness in the world. And we don't need to look far to see darkness. Darkness is all around us. There is darkness everywhere. But John says that Jesus came to be the light in the darkness. Jesus came to bring hope where there is despair. He came to bring joy where there is sorrow. He came to bring comfort where there is grieving, healing where there is hurting. He came to bring truth where there is deception. He came to bring um, truth where there is deception. And ultimately, he came to bring life where there is death. And Jesus came to be the light in this darkness. In this Christmas story, Jesus would be the one to bring light to the darkness in Mary and Joseph. Jesus was the one who would bring light to the nation of Israel. He came to bring light to the darkness of the world. And ultimately, Jesus is there to bring light to the darkness of our lives. Jesus will bring light to your life. He will bring light to my life. He will bring light to this incredible nation of South Africa. And the promise is that the darkness will not overcome the light. Amen. And so the question that I have for you today, the question that I'm asking this morning is what are you seeing in your life that is not really there? What are you believing in your life 
that is not really true. Because Jesus was born to bring light into those situations of your life. As the band comes up, the whole world was expecting a king. And to everyone's amazement, this king arrived as a baby. A baby that was born in a lowly manger. This morning we need to remember that God is always working. He is working behind the scenes. He is working in the waiting. He is working in the darkness. And he is working to bring the light. The gift that no one expected turned out to be the king that no one expected. And this king was the great light of the world. Did you know that it's the darkness of this world that causes people to believe things about God that are simply not true? It's the darkness of this world that causes people to believe things about God that are simply not true. And at the end of Jesus' ministry on earth, when he had finished his ministry on earth and he was ascending back up into heaven, we find him saying that as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. You are now the light of the world. As the Father sent me, now I am sending you. God First City Church, you are now the light of the world. And that is my encouragement for you this morning as we go into this Christmas season as you start looking uh, into the next year ahead. You are the light of the world. You are the light carrier. And in a world that is dark and where there is darkness all around you, you need to remember that the darkness cannot overcome the light. And you are the bearer of that light. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we want to say thank you, thank you so much for this light in our lives. We want to thank you for the light that came into the world as a baby born in a lowly manger to save the world of its sin and to save the world of its darkness. And so, Father, this morning we look to you and we say thank you for the light. We thank you that we are the bearers of this light. And we ask, ask God, help us, prepare us, make us into your image to be the light that this world so desperately needs. Father God, we ask that as we pour ourselves out, that you would create that new wine in us. That as we step forward, as we look to you, as we are the light of the world, as you are the light of the world, that you would do that work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.